Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Liar! Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Haskin, and you know, we're we're finishing up the last couple of tracks from the bonus section of the deluxe CD of the Conquest album. This song, Lying, was recorded for the Conquest sessions in 79. However, it wasn't actually released until the remastered CD came out in 1997. So this wasn't one that people got to hear right off the bat. You know, it's really kind of strange when you think about it. At this point, there's only two people that have been in the band since the beginning, and that's Mick Box and Ken Hensley. Now, of course, Ken uh, joined when they turned from Spice into Uriah Heap, but Mick had been there since the beginning of Spice. So uh, he's been in the band a little bit longer, but the official Uriah Heap releases, Ken Hensley has been there since the first album. And to know that, you know, these are the last couple of songs where we'll get to go over uh, anything that Ken had worked on. It's kind of weird to think about, but the band carried on. And this is the most important thing to me because Mick could have easily said, you know what, I'm I'm done with all the changes. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something that's a little more stable, started a new band or joined another band. He could have done anything. And he decided to keep your eye heat going. And I'm so, so grateful that he did, especially, you know, when you listen to the kind of stuff that they're doing nowadays, like just the Live in the Dream album, such a solid album. And I'm so glad that they put that out. And, you know, that's that's all because of Mick keeping the band together. So thank you, Mick, for doing that. I'm sure it was not easy over the years. However, we're going to dig into the song Lion. Not Lion, Lying. You think I'd know how to pronounce the song title. Lying from Uriah Heep from the album Conquest. Well, this is very cool. For one, uh, I'm super excited about the return of the theremin. We have not heard that in quite some time. And what an interesting and intriguing sound this song has. It's kind of mysterious. Uh, I think it could have been great as the opening to, say, a sci-fi show or a paranormal show. Would have been really cool, like in search of that uh, Rod, not Rod Serling, uh, Leonard Nimoy hosted. And something like that or something that Dan Aykroyd did because he's done a lot of those, you know, UFO and and, uh, paranormal videos. Really great opening. Uh, Obviously, now with that drum fill, which is a really kick ass drum fill, by the way, uh, obviously, we're going to go into something that's a bit heavier. But just that intro alone, I think, could have easily been licensed for a television show or a movie. That was probably the most unexpected change I think we've heard in a Uriah Heap song so far. Really unexpected. I would never have guessed that the song was going to go in the direction that it did based on that opening. But very cool. And see, this to me is getting back to the stuff that we've known from the band for a while where you just don't know where it's going to go. You can't hear the beginning of the song and think that you're going to know how the song uh, goes because... We've we've been through the last couple of albums where they are very consistent, um, not a lot of surprises, just great music. But now we're getting back into that. Wow, I did not see that coming factor. So I really like that. Really love the way that um, that that John Sloman sounds on this. Uh, He's using that more straight ahead voice. And I think he just sounds so good like that. 
Um, it's nice to hear some inflections in there, but I think he just sounds so good when he's singing straightforward. Um, you know, and of course, great drums, uh, great bass. It's, it's nice to hear the organ back in the mix. Um, really good so far. I say so far as if I expect it's not going to continue to be good. Well, you know, you got to love that piano sound. You know, it sounds a little bit warped, like it's been out in the rain for a couple of days and the wood has seen some action. Uh, but I like the sound of it. And uh, we've heard this before. I can't think of the song, but we've heard it before. And also, is it is it my imagination or is Trevor Boulder playing a fretless bass on here? I could be wrong. I looked it up to see how old the fretless bass was because I genuinely have absolutely no idea. I don't I don't pay attention to history that much. But I looked and I found that the first fretless bass actually came out in 1966. It was an Ampeg. And then Fender came out with theirs in 1970. It was a precision P bass uh, fretless. And so, you know, it was certainly available. We're talking 79 here. So he could have had a Fender P bass. And uh, I don't know, it just sounds like he's playing a fretless. So uh, you guys tell me if you think I'm wrong or if you know I'm right. Or if you know I'm wrong, or if you think I'm right, either way, let me know what you think. This is definitely a bass and piano heavy mix, but try and see if you can hear the hi-hats because Chris Slade just started playing 16th notes on the hi-hat. They sound fantastic. A really nice way to help move a song along when you're really only focusing on a couple of instruments and it can seem a little bit dry, maybe not as, as full as the sound could be. So, you know, upping the, uh, the sound of the drums without really increasing volume or anything, just by giving it that kind of um, locomotive feeling can really make a difference in a song, as we can see here. I really like how tight they sound together. I mean, this definitely feels like they, they're they very comfortable with each other by this point. You know, I don't know what order uh, any of the songs were recorded. And so this could have been the first one. It could have been the last one. But they sound really good together, like a really cohesive band. And, you know, there's times when you listen to bands or especially live where they're just not together. It's almost like they think they're the only ones in the room. They're so far apart. But in this case, I mean, they, they definitely feel like they were all sitting in the same room looking at each other, just, you know, all in sync together. I really like that feel. You know, all the guitars that I'm hearing are slightly to the right side, which usually means that Ken is playing. Um, they may have put Mick over on the right side by mistake. Who knows? 
but um, not quite sure who's actually playing here because we do have keyboard in the background, so it would make more sense that Mick was playing guitar, but the positioning is a little confusing just going by their standard way of mixing things as they've done for 13 albums now. So uh, kind of interesting. I like the sound of the guitar, though. I think the distortion level is good. I like what it's playing during the chorus. I'm not really hearing any guitars during the verse. So um, kind of interesting. Well, I like that John changed his voice a little bit there. Um, it's it's a different tone that we're getting from him, but it sounds really good. Uh, again, it's it's interesting how the song doesn't feel empty with there being no guitar on the left, but they've they've moved some of the synths over there to kind of fill up the sound a little bit. They're subtle, but they're there. And then uh, great build into whatever we're headed into next. I love that the way that that sweeping synth comes in, very nice. But um, yeah, cool song. It's just a, a I would I'm expecting the balance to be off and it's not just because again, everything seems to be more on the right side, but they've done a great job with uh with putting some synth over on the left so that it doesn't feel too empty over there. Okay, that might have been a little bit over the top or, you know, as close as you can get to it without being a little over the top. But uh, his voice sounds good. I really like the, the tone of his voice. Um, the bass guitar is definitely drowning out the bass drum, so I can't really hear what Chris is playing on the bass drum. The snare is in the background. It's It's really not hitting me in the chest like it should. So, you know, the mix is not the greatest on this song, but it's still pretty good. I mean, you can hear the dynamics in the guitars and the bass. You're just not getting the drums as much. The toms sound really good. Those cut through nicely, but the kick and snare, which is what you really need to be in the foreground for drums or closest to the fore foreground for drums, um, just really buried, which is a shame because I think that the song uh, does suffer a little bit for it. I think it would be much better if it was a little more balanced there. But it's a cool song. It's got a great groove to it. The bass is phenomenal. You know, here's Trevor Boulder again, just kicking ass and uh, and, and really uh, turning me around on where I stood from him when he first came into the band a few albums ago. So, um, yeah, really cool. Well, that's kind of a short fade with a with a great groove and a great riff like that. I kind of would have expected this would have been a longer fade. Um, would have liked to have seen, um, you know, John Sloman riff a little bit more, some really cool feels by Chris Slade. But they faded it where they faded it. Um, you know, that's usually not the band's decision anyway. That's usually done by the uh, producer and the engineer. But it's a good song. I like it. I think it's, it's definitely uh, back to rock and roll which uh, it's, it's nice to see the band getting kind of refocused on that again. I'm hoping that that will, uh, I mean, from the songs that I know from Abominog, I would say that it does head more in that direction, but uh, it's, it's nice to see it here as well. I think Chris, uh, Chris is, re is really great on this song. What you can hear of it, I think it's just a shame that the kick and snare are, are a little bit lost over the bass or under the bass, I should say. Um, great work from Ken Hensley. Uh, John Sloman's on point with the vocals. I think he's 
he's kind of like, I want to push it, but I don't want to push it any further than I'm pushing it uh, as, as far as, you know, different pitches and, and styles and things like that. But I do like the couple changes that he did put in there. I thought they were good. Um, I, I'm just wondering if mix on the song, that would be the biggest question for me. Um, because like I said, I'm not really hearing any guitar in the left ear and that's where he usually is, but there's so much keyboard work going on. It seems like it would have been weird not to use him on the song and have Ken do everything. I don't know. This was also a weird time in the band. Um, you know, as like, like, as I said, we're, we're seeing about to see the departure of Ken Hensley. So, um, it, it's got to be rough waters. I'm sure that there were things that were happening in the studio and, you know, maybe Ken said, well, I'll just do it and did it one night when there was no one there. Who knows? Um, but in any case, the point is the song and the song is a really good song. I really like it. I like the sound of it. I like the feel. It's very energetic. Um, it's weird. I mean, it's kind of happy for singing about someone who's lying, but that's what I love about art is that it can be interpreted any way. You know, not every breakup song has to sound sad. Not every, you know, love song has to sound happy and exciting. Sometimes they can be dramatic. Sometimes they can be dark just as you're coming out of one phase of your life into another. And that's the thing I love about music is that you can take any subject and portray it pretty much any way that you want to. As long as it sounds good and it makes sense, then the listener will will just kind of lock onto it. So I think this is a perfect example of that. It's it's almost contrast, you know, to it, it, it because it's not being sung from an angry fashion. I don't feel it's just aggressive in the you know in the music being driving. So I don't know. You guys, uh, you guys enjoy it hopefully and have some good thoughts about the song. I will come back on Thursday with another episode as as we actually do the last track from Conquest, the last bonus track. And and uh, I've already recorded that episode. I did them a little bit out of order this time. And I'm just going to tell you now, the that song has been stuck in my head and uh, it might happen to you. So fair warning, if you listen to the next episode, you could have a song stuck in your head. Of course, that probably happens a lot with these guys because they're, they write such great songs. Have a great day, everybody. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days. <laughs>